Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, campus minister and assistant professor of philosophy at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. When you think of the larger systemic problems of world hunger mm -hmm. and the racial problems in the United States and unemployment and uh, nuclear proliferation, we really do see problems here. I mean, I mean, it seems so great and vast that you can't get hold of it. I always think about one of my students in responding to a question about why are people dropping out of the movements or why can't we get the social involvement. He looked at me and says, hey, man, if I took all that seriously, that would just tear me up. Joining Father Basic in today's Reflections is Ross Miller, the director of United Christian Fellowship at Bowling Green State University. Today's Reflections focuses on the topic of social justice issues on campus. Here's Father Basic. Ross, we have shared a common position over the years as that of campus minister at Bowling Green State University, and we've had a lot of good times over those years, our share of failures as well, but it is, in general, has been an exciting time. It's been a good place to be a minister and to try to uh, make the Christian tradition real for people, and I've certainly enjoyed your friendship over the years, and we uh, find ourselves agreeing on a lot of issues right. uh, and uh, having a lot of chance to talk about those and work together. So I'm glad that uh, we will have the chance to talk a bit about that. We'll talk about our, our university life a bit, and uh, let's uh, uh, talk especially about the social side of it, the social involvement, uh, the problems of injustice in the world, the social dimension of the gospel, the way people are involved in the causes and the movements. Now, I think that people, when they would originally start to think of that, would say, boy, they think of the 60s when students were really there and we were involved in peace rallies, and I can remember getting up in front of a large group and talking after the Cambodian bombing, and I can remember all of your work with the draft uh, resistors and uh, counseling of people who were involved in those questions. And uh, it seemed in one way to be a more exciting time for us. I think we were more visible and public in those days. Uh, and yet there's a way in which all of that was overblown, in which uh, there was still a rather small group of students very interested in all of that. And uh, I we always wondered about the depth of the commitment mm -hmm. involved. Yes. But it did have a certain exhilaration and excitement about it. And one of the common things to be said since then is that, well, the movements have died. The interest mm -hmm. in civil rights and racial harmony and peace and war, the great questions have somehow got set aside. Now, I'm of the opinion, and you can offer yours after I finish mm -hmm. this here, but that in one way, the 60s were overblown, that it was never that big and that powerful a movement. But on the other hand, the uh, lack of involvement and interest uh, perceived now is also out of whack in some ways. So mm -hmm. we find, I think, a same hardcore group of people willing to work over a long haul on these social justice questions. I think our social justice committee at the university has proved, been mm -hmm. extremely good the last couple mm -hmm. of years. They've mm -hmm. taken on causes. They've done their homework well. They've uh, produced some good results. Uh, we find people in our parish, I know, who are very involved. Our volunteer program has uh, really doubled, I think, in the mm -hmm. last year. We have over a hundred of our students mm -hmm. who are involved in tutoring in the inner city or doing uh, helping at the nursing mm -hmm. homes or mm -hmm. trying to teach English to foreign uh, people. So I think in many ways I would say that there is the same sort of mm -hmm. hardcore mm -hmm interest in spreading the gospel in the social dimension and perhaps it doesn't get the media coverage today probably people aren't uh, as aware of those kinds of things that i've just been discussing i would agree with that uh, with your two points there uh, in general uh there's no question but what uh, various studies uh, by carnegie uh, uh, and uh, others would indicate that in general student attitudes have so changed some on issues over the past 10 years that is there's a little less concern for minorities. There's a little, uh, uh, there's some change. And so perhaps uh, there's a way in which students aren't as active. And then the freshman profile at uh, Bowling Green this last year uh, 
suggests that uh, uh, eight point four percent of the freshmen would be interested in participating in some kind of a group that that dealt with some kind of social issues, and that's compared to sixty five percent who'd be interested in something relating to their major. And so uh, you say, my goodness, these students are pretty much focused on vocation and not on trying to help other sorts of people. Uh, and yet there is a, a fair amount of, uh, even if you take that 8.4% or you take a, a core of people, I'm not sure how many people 10 years ago really were involved, as you said. And I always felt that there was a kind of a group of people that were, were very, very highly committed, but there were a lot of other people whose involvement was kind of uh, just participating in what was going on. They probably didn't know exactly what was happening to them. Uh, it was interesting what happened to the uh, peace movement after the draft lottery was set up so that now a certain number of people were absolutely safe from the draft. And it was a very wise administrative move to uh, defuse that kind of a thing. So part of it was, it has to do with uh, there's nothing happening that directly fa affects people. So the people we see that are the idealists now are the people who are the true idealists. They're really concerned about helping other people. Uh, a philosophy professor at Bowling Green uh, said a, uh, an interesting thing to me. He teaches a course on, uh, on alternative communities. And strangely enough, he gets a lot of people for his course. And uh, I could indicate some other things. Uh, the environmental ethics course and the environmental politics courses uh, I have surprisingly large numbers of students again, and uh, the the two professors who teach those have uh, so they can't understand uh, this little surge of idealism. Mm -hmm. But uh, the professor who teaches the alternatives course says, you know, he really believes that the same kind of idealism that was uh, true ten years ago is in students uh, that they really would like to see some alternatives in our society, that they really would like to see a peaceful and uh, society, a just society but that there are a good many of them who feel that it's simply not possible. And so they have a kind of cynicism built into them. And in his classes, uh, it emerges sometimes when they begin to think, there is something maybe that I can do. I think there's a, it's part of a general malaise that we've spoken about mm -hmm. many times, that there's a sense that, uh, that maybe you can't do much to change the world. Uh, however, uh, you mentioned the volunteer programs, and we have uh, three volunteer programs out of our center, a tutoring program, working with handicapped, and working with senior citizens. And again, we, we've had just an incredible number, I think 256 people this year involved in those programs. That's and wonderful. we've even had to turn some away. We couldn't, people wanted to tutor and we didn't have enough uh, children. And uh, so I think it has to do with the fact that uh, if I can help one person, I mean, I think there are a lot of people who say, I'm, I'm for helping people. I don't know if I can change the world, but at least I can take this little step. And so I can give a couple of hours uh, here or there in my week. And uh, it's a sacrifice. It takes time. Uh, but uh, there are a number of people who I think are willing to do this who maybe wouldn't join a committee to organize anything to, uh, to try to mm. change what's happening in El Salvador. I think there's that interest in the one-to-one, -one and especially where you can see some accomplishment. When you're teaching right. English to a Laotian, you can see the progress. And I think there, that is fulfilling to many people, mm -hmm. and we do have many people of goodwill. When you think of the larger systemic problems of world hunger, Mm -hmm. and the racial problems in the United States and unemployment and uh, nuclear proliferation. We really do uh, see problems here. I mean, I mean, it seems so great and vast that you can't get hold of it. I always think about one of my students in responding to a question about why are people dropping out of the movements or why can't we get the social involvement. He looked at me and says, hey, man, if I took all that seriously, that would just tear me up. Yes. And he was a sensitive man, and, yeah. and he felt that if he really immersed himself in that, he would be always psychically out of equilibrium. He would be just torn up inside. And I believe that's one of the reasons that people very often have uh, dropped out of the ch movement towards systemic change or structural change. Mm -hmm. It's uh, They say, well, what can I do as one yeah. person? How are we going yeah. to somehow help uh, on the hunger issue? I know in our parish, when we raise the social questions, for example, if we're preaching on it in a given weekend, 
One of the things that we'll try to do is to provide a lot of options or opportunities for people to do something constructive about it. So if we're talking about world hunger, maybe we will have a mm -hmm. table in our lounge where people could go in and write a letter to their congressman mm -hmm. to in favor of some legislation. Or we'll have the opportunity for them to join Bread for the World, mm -hmm. an organization which lobbies Congress to try to get sure. some action. Or we'll set up a seminar during that week where people could study and try to learn more about the question of world hunger. Or maybe mm -hmm. there's an opportunity to give some uh, money or canned goods for the poor. And it seems as though if people are presented with concrete options like that, there's a better chance of drawing them in to the whole general right. thrust in favor of the yeah, social gospel. We had a gospel. very strong response in uh, the community, which included a fair number of uh, university folks uh, of all sorts of religious persuasions. I was amazed to see uh, churches that ordinarily don't participate with other churches actually participate in uh, a hunger walk. Yeah, on, on Palm Sunday afternoon, and it was the largest number of people participating ever. That's right. We've had that for a number of years. And and last uh, year was more than... Yeah, you know, it was a, an amazing kind of a thing to see this mm -hmm. kind of involvement. I was so pleased especially to see the some of the uh, very conservative churches participating uh, so that, you know, the people out of the Born Again movement were saying, if I can do this one thing for, for hunger, I think, uh, you know, part of what's happened... Uh, to the so-called movement sorts of things, is that a lot of these uh, movements for change actually did work to a certain extent and became uh, became institutionalized to some degree. Now, you remember a peace speaker we had here uh, that we co-sponsored a few years back, or I remember us sitting and talking uh, at one of your conversations with uh, this man who was, I can't remember, with American Friends or some other group, but he had been one of the leading peace I activists. But at the present time, he was building a cabin building in Pennsylvania. A log cabin, I remember. <laughs> and that, I, yeah. I think you know somebody said, "Well, where's the peace movement? It's building a log cabin in Pennsylvania." That that here was a very specific act that he could carry on at least for the temporary moment. I think there are a lot of other examples of uh, persons who uh, sort of say, "Okay, for now, I want to work." I, this summer, at a, at a little commune out in the North Carolina mountains, I met one of the people who worked in Berkeley on the People's Park thing who now is uh, he's building greenhouses and working in a little project to help poor people in that area find better ways to uh, to fix their houses so that they're warmer in the winter, so that they can grow crops and be more self-sufficient, and to, uh, to maintain their land so that the developers from Florida don't just buy them all up and push them off the land. And so, and he's very well accepted in this little mountain community and I remember talking one beautiful moonlight night about, you know, here he was, a people park uh, radical, but who was doing something very specific, very clear-cut. He didn't know if this, he didn't believe this was going to save the world. Well, we have this group of people now that are starting this little experiment out uh, for a summer out on this farm, the Simple Living Experiment, out of the Social Justice Committee and St. Thomas More. And, it is uh, impressive, isn't it, to see young people wanting to get back to some sort of simple life. But it's a very clear-cut kind of project. Yes. And we have a we have a food co-op out of our place, mm -hmm. and this emerged out of a group of people that were searching for ways to uh, to be better stewards of their their lives, and uh, it it seems to succeed, and uh, and and then people participate, and uh, it's amazing. But here's a very well, all I'm saying is that these maybe there are a lot of people who have said, let me see what I can do that's very specific, uh, that's here and now, uh, rather than try to solve the whole world's problems you see and i think people have picked a particular kind of issue so you if you you'll find a group of people working on women's issues in the university it's not a huge big group uh, uh you pe some people working on minority kinds of issues and uh on the peace issues and uh, social justice issues they're they're there but they are they aren't as visible uh, mm -hmm. they're doing very specific little projects right and and they are able to see more results or be more directly involved that seems to be what uh, grabs people i think the uh, ross i'm trying to relate this a bit to the religious dimension there's a couple of things that uh come to mind in that way there's um some people who sort of feel that uh, religion doesn't have anything to do with that. You and I both end mm -hmm. up preaching to people and teaching people who want to confine religion to worship and want Christianity to be kept somehow mm -hmm. inside the sacristy mm -hmm. or the church and mm -hmm. the worship service and not to have anything to do with the larger world. And 
I know over the years consistently we've tried to preach something of what we would call the social dimension of the gospel mm -hmm. and trying to remind people that Christianity has to do with how we live our life as a whole and that love of neighbor is a constitutive element in the whole living out of the gospel and that systems and structures and institutions always often do oppress people and enslave people and they have to be challenged in that way. So that we, we need to keep pushing this and we're speaking a little optimistically here about the involvement but we got to remember it's still a minority group of yes. people mm -hmm. and that we don't feel satisfied in any way with the uh, general response to the social gospel there's so much more that really needs to be mm -hmm. done so we have to to work on that side of it and the other side I was thinking is that um, some people feel that somehow religion uh, will uh, has nothing constructive to offer at all to the social apostle i'm thinking of the side of the people who are involved in it it was interesting that the we have the alternative newspaper called undercurrents on our mm -hmm. campus and uh, i was asked uh, by the editors to write an article on this theme why social activists should reconsider their religious tradition and I found that assignment to be very interesting mm. that they would be looking for that. And I tried to uh, make uh, the point in the article that it appeared to me that religion could be a help in sustaining the interest in the social Surely. causes, that you need a value system that will keep you going even mm -hmm. when you don't see any particular results. You need something that gives you hope and a sense that my effort is worthwhile. This is what happened in the 60s with some of those people that we knew, or the Surely. early 70s. They got in there and they said, we're going to change it in six months, and when it didn't happen, yes. where were we? Now, I wrote yeah. in this article about the, the great people who have sustained themselves in the, in the cause of social justice. I thought of Mother Teresa sure. working out of her Catholic tradition, sure. Cesar Chavez out of a very traditional piety, Martin Luther King using the Christian symbols in order to sure. make the civil rights yeah. movement go, Gandhi working out of the Hindu tradition and liberating India, the Berrigan brothers out of their Catholic tradition. Sure. So you see that happening, and I, I think that that needs to be said. There is a sustaining yeah. power there. I think there's there. kind of a, a dialectic or a back and forth. Uh, and this is uh, oversimplifying, but that uh, that uh, a good faith or a healthy faith is is one that uh, needs a good bit of uh, spirituality and uh, inner life and uh, the kind of thing you're mentioning. Um, and prayer and uh, worship and and all of this sort of thing and uh, and then it needs to be expressed in its outward ways and so uh, you have both of those kinds of uh, parts of to, to faith and I think in terms of the the way the church has gone and I, I am hesitant to speak for other than Protestant churches but but there's kind of a back and forth movement there and I think what we've experienced particularly in the Protestant church though I think the Catholic charismatic movement and things would uh, w would indicate a similar kind of thing that there was kind of a feeling that perhaps we had abandoned the inner life and the and the communal life and uh, we've experienced a certain kind of uh, pendulum swing and uh, in the Protestant uh, communions and, uh, and around the edges the uh, tremendous uh, born-again kind of phenomenon that we've seen the new uh, the revivalism and so forth yet we even see there now the movement back the uh, the evangelicals for social uh, change and justice or uh, whatever they call themselves and it's you know there's a people then that begin to really get into it and explore their roots many of them begin to discover oh sojourners uh, we visited Sojourners with a student group last year. This is a magazine, year. Evangelical Magazine. It's a uh, magazine started by uh, evangelicals, but who really uh, say that to to be true to the gospel, and they they are uh, you know direct Bible believing Christians who've been born again, with the experience that uh, has credentials anywhere, say that uh, you know we've got to work for racial justice and for peace to stop the arms race. And we visited that uh, community a year ago in Washington. Uh, and uh, we're so impressed, but they have a strong prayer life, and uh, their magazine, as you well know, is, is a combination of uh, very outspoken articles about issues and uh, articles about prayer. They put a lot of stuff in there about uh, Thomas Merton and uh, Henri Nouwen and uh, other uh, spiritual leaders, so there's that combination, and I think uh, that's the ideal, and, and uh, out of my own tradition, this would be the ideal, a combination of, of piety and action. But I think that in terms of the way that the institution moves, you kind of see a pendulum swing. Right now, we have been in a swing 
in all of our denominations back to a conservative thing. That um, it's been harder and harder to to get efforts to deal with racism and sexism and so forth. Uh, however, uh, you know, I think that it will move back. I think we probably needed some of that, and we've. Uh, some of the greater answer. interest in the development of the spiritual life yeah, and right. meditation uh, and so on. And so now we mm. need... So we've seen a couple of things. One, we have seen that uh, kind of institutionalized. There was some good change in a lot of these areas. And uh, and so that, you know, took the visibility away from it. On campus, a lot of the things that were raised got institutionalized uh, about student uh, rights, uh, student participation and and uh, black studies and women's studies and all kinds of things that people were raising a fuss about uh, were institutionalized and, and game apart. Uh, people didn't have as much to, uh, to complain about. I noticed the right wing, or the new Christian right as it's called, is constantly saying that it has the privilege and the opportunity and the right to be involved in these social questions. Mm -hmm. And they will always say, well, look at the liberal wing of mm -hmm. the Christian tradition has always been doing this, was against the war in Vietnam and mm -hmm. was working for civil rights and on the marches and all that. And why don't they have the right? And I think that they, they absolutely do. I think that uh, all Christian people have a right to be involved in the political, the social, economic order. And I think they are correct in this, and I consider this to be a positive development where the evangelical side of Christianity is recognizing this more. I'm not so sure, Ross, that I see this so much on our campus. Do you, do you think that our evangelical groupings on campus seem to be adopting that orientation? I know you and I tried to open up a little dialogue with them after you were at a conference and heard one of the evangelical speakers mm -hmm. tell mm -hmm. the audience mm -hmm. that, hey, we must be involved in social yeah. justice, and yeah. we were trying to open that up. But I'm, I'm not so sure that I detect that, well, but I could be wrong I, about I that. I see it just in very small pockets. Uh, uh, one of the groups on our campus that started many years ago that really emerged out of what in those days was the Jesus Movement and used to meet in our building and finally has become a congregation in its own and uh, which used to forbid its members to have anything to do with uh, other groups. Uh, that group has become involved in the community to the extent that they uh, do things for charity, and they were one of the groups that participated in the Hunger Walk. Now, I, I see a kind of development there. I've had individual students, uh, a student out of one of the very conservative groups came to me and said, you know, I'm interested in the church in poverty. I want to do a reading course for sociology class, and uh, uh, and uh, so I I think that uh, there's something about people starting to read the Bible if they if they wander around enough they begin to get stuff like let justice roll down like waters and uh, and that uh, to do justice and and uh, all of these things and uh, the concern for the poor and the oppressed and the fatherless and uh, and so you know this Bible reading they get beyond. Uh, uh, believe and uh, be born again and begin to realize that, uh, you know, a cup of water for the thirsty, that it's all part of the gospel and it's all very important, but that it's all there. And I agree with you that I don't see a big surge in this direction, mm -hmm. though. Of course, we don't see a big surge in the mainline churches either. That's right. The, and the mainline still... churches have pulled back. Uh, many mainline churches have uh, have experienced splits and uh, people have left because they, they didn't have certain needs being met and uh, so I think and I think uh, the old uh, liberals of all kinds have been uh, chastened somewhat uh, your friend uh, Michael Novak is uh, Mark, uh, someone speaks about hmm. him he's really fighting his old shadows that is some of the people are complaining about the the old uh, the, the liberals are really uh, those people are gone. I mean, you think the people in the mainline churches now realize that you can't bring about this cheery, wonderful world through any kind of just strong human effort. Mm -hmm. uh, so that it's a struggle, a long struggle that has to be sustained by this spiritual uh, uh, depth and this uh, communal experience. Certainly, as uh, those that are working out of the liberal tradition, we need to find new and better expressions, I think, for the social gospel and maybe learn to build new coalitions. That's one thing that's happening now, I think, as a result of the great success of the moral majority, or at least as it's claimed. I often wonder if it really was that powerful in the last election. But there is a swing or a movement within liberal Christianity now to try to form coalitions to get their viewpoint in front of the public and to think about electing candidates that reflect uh, that kind of outlook. 
um, so that maybe the liberals have, have learned something about the forming of coalitions and so on. We really have a, a long ways to go, Ross, don't we, in trying to get this social gospel out and trying to get people involved. We still have a small percentage of people that are doing that. Maybe that's the way it will always be, in a way. I mean, you ever notice that when you preach on social justice questions, it's harder to keep the interest. It's harder to mm -hmm. keep people with you. Because right. I think part of it is we live in such a personalistic age and a certain individualism that's always right. been part of our American temper, but it seems to be so much to the fore now. So people are interested in mm -hmm. personal prayer or meditation or spirituality mm -hmm. as a way of developing their life. I like to keep saying that the prophetic dimension is an important part of spirituality, that involvement in the social justice issues is in a constitutive element of the gospel. That's a quote from our bishops, and I think a, a vital one to keep in front of people. Now, so, Ross, we've been talking about this, uh, the social dimension of the gospel among our young people, and uh, we've brought a number of points uh, to light here. I think that probably the, one of the major things we need to figure out is how to increase that involvement, how to uh, give a sort of an enthusiasm to others about what's possible here. We need to find better ways of uh, telling people that the love of neighbor has a structural and institutional side of it and that we need to be involved in that if we're going to be really effective witnesses to the gospel. You've been listening to Reflections with your host, theologian Father James Basic, campus minister and assistant professor of philosophy at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. Joining Father Basic in this discussion was Ross Miller, the director of United Christian Fellowship at Bowling Green State University. The topic of this week's Reflections was social justice issues on campus. If you have any questions about today's program or any ideas for topics you'd like to hear discussed, please write to Reflections in care of WLQR, Toledo, Ohio, 43623. Produced in the studios of WLQR, Reflections is directed by Mark Ferguson. Executive producer is Mary Beth Kirshner. Reflections is brought to you by the Genesis Radio Network.